Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Property Hustler Show, where today we're going to be talking about land development, mindset, and real estate education. Today, we have a very special guest, Matthew Frederick, who is a longtime real estate investor and developer right here in Canada, as well as internationally. And he is also a mentor for a great many students that's helped a lot of people out, including us. So, Matthew, great to have you on the show. Well, you know what? I'm happy to be here, and I've actually been looking forward to this. Sometimes people view it as if it's just like, well, what is it that I want to do here? But really what you want to do here is you want to like do some business, make some money on the That's project, right. right? That's what you want to do. It's not about like what you want to build. You need, you want to do whatever will make you the, <laughs> whatever is the best deal. Right. And, and you sort of find the mid ground. Yeah. I know what I want to build. I don't want to build a, a seven story. I may mm -hmm. still want to build with wood. So I may stay six stories on below. At the same time, if they don't need six stories in the area, if there's concerns, then you know what? Maybe I'll stay with within what they need. Again, as long as mathematically, it makes sense for me. And I really want to do a three-year project so that my investors can see the first project done right on time. That's my prototype. And now it sets the stage for now I can talk to other investors. I don't want to get into a five-year project. Let it be six years. Now I go back to investors in the future and I say to them, well, you know, I fought the city because they don't know what they're doing. They're terrible. They don't oh, care. They don't care. They don't care, yeah. they don't care about that. They just want to know, can you do exactly what you promised and can you do it on time yeah. and that's my that's my my philosophy and how I, I deal with things right so with three year term uh you still need to go through rezonings and all it that did. stuff but you're not going to be selecting the lane that city's planning zoning by law like, the zoning by law yeah, yeah the, the zoning plan I, I take a look at it and i see you know is there anybody else first of all doing that which means even if it says that as high as i can go is four stories anybody else in the area have they done six so if there's precedent then okay I feel good about that. It's really to do with setbacks, parking, right. um, height, materials, Shadow and things casting, like that. So you don't, casting. Yeah, you don't try to be the very first one then? No, I don't. Yeah, yeah I, okay. don't. I mean, I think the same applies for people who are looking to do teardowns and build custom homes. Yeah. If you want to build, if there's bungalows, but then one guy's actually done a three-story flat right. top, right? Like then you can possibly do it. There's, there's precedence and there. It means you can probably do a variance. That I feel is a very solid strategy for anybody to execute that wants to do this because land assembly, a lot of people talk about it, but in terms of how you actually approach it it's a skill set that really requires you know somebody boots on the ground somebody to go and have those conversations and yeah. really know what they need not only know what they need what they what the community needs what the city wants and to be piecing all this together it's not just piecing the land it's piecing also what everybody wants it's so true one more point too i found pieces of land with uh there's a house there's let's say a nice chunk of land beside it if you talk to that person hey i want to buy that land Sometimes they don't want you to get the land because they don't want you to succeed. So oh, I say I'm to sure them- there's a lot of people like It's that. true. So I say to them, listen, why haven't you built? And is it because a knowledge situation? Is it a money situation? Because if it's the knowledge situation and you want to still take a piece of this pie, because it's probably what you planned in the beginning 20, 30 years ago, we can still do that too. You can be a partner. We can bore against your property. We can sever it a lot. You can be a partner in the process. So you're going to share from the proceeds of whatever I do. Mm. So I don't have an issue bringing them in as a partner which is great because now I don't have to pay for the land because they're the partner. They'll get their due on that piece of land once the property is built. Do you find that that has any element of risk? Because we, we've thought about that mm -hmm. in a couple of situations, but sometimes the people that you're dealing with, it adds a, an element or a variable that it can't be so properly controlled, right? Because you might go do all the due <clears> diligence, <throat> you might go put in the work, you might even pay for some things to be done in order to know whether X, Y, and Z can proceed, like the building. And then you have a partner there who's controlling the land that might not play ball the way you want. And you know, that's 100% right. So we have to deal with that with our agreement. So whatever structure that we're going in there with. So if it's some kind of a joint venture agreement, it's going to be about 30 or 40 pages. It has to deal with every conceivable issue so that the, the fewer issues you have to deal with on the fly, the better, which means I'm going to talk to them about what if somebody dies? What if somebody gets incapacitated? What if somebody gets divorced? What if somebody goes bankrupt? What happens if A, B, or C, or D happens? And then how much control they actually have? Are they silent partners? You know, how I actually um, you know, meet with them and discuss what is happening. You're 100% right. The less information you have signed together with them, it opens up more uh, doors and windows for difficulty. Mm -hmm. So I make sure that I cover pretty much everything conceivable and they agree upon it ahead of time. Although you don't catch everything, you get most things. But does a contract really 
enforce compliance because when you do a contract like that, if they still own title mm -hmm. to the property, it can still leave you in a stuck position if they, even if everything's written out. Because how do you even litigate something like that? I think at the point where you have to litigate yeah. it, it's like it's loose, loose, yeah, loose everybody situation. loses, right? Okay, so, yeah. yeah, so it's true. So sometimes it, it depends on what you have in place. So for instance, I might do some called. So for instance, if the land needs to be severed, let's say it's been severed, right? So now it's two pieces. Yeah. Like ultimately, I, I can enter into an agreement where we do a quit claim deed where they quit the claim of that piece of property into, let's say, a corporation. And you're 50% of the corporation, I'm 50% of the corporation. So technically, even though it's a piece of land that was your land, you've quit a portion of your claim to that land, which means it's no longer your land to control. Where does a claim deed get registered? A quit claim deed at land, land titles land registry. Okay. So for instance, if, um, if, if you owe me money on a yeah. mortgage, yeah. Uh, let's say a vendor take back mortgage, and you don't pay me, I can actually foreclose you. Not foreclose, but power of sale you, because a power of sale is a contract action. Mm -hmm. And I can obviously take that uh, property to a realtor, and they would sell the property on the open market. Or I can say to you, sign a quit claim deed, and now your property is mine, and pretty much you leave, I go, but I've recovered my money. And a quit claim deed goes through a lawyer, and it obviously is secured on title to show that I have now taken over the, the, the deed. You have surrendered your deed. Does that interfere right. with mortgages or anything? Now, if there's a mortgage, there'll be an issue, right? So if there's a mortgage, you can't just quit claim a deed on your mortgage because the bank has, has some action there as well. So again, it all depends on, on the scenario. If there's a mortgage, you'd probably do something a little bit different. Usually yeah. with severance, it's like the bank wants, the, the bank needs to be notified, right? Yes. And yes. then a lot of times you do need to actually pay that out or like yes. use the private lending thing or that. Or reappraise the value yeah. if there's enough equity in there too. Exactly. Yeah. But yeah. usually that becomes a two different titles. So the bank yeah. usually doesn't want to stay in. It's true because, yeah. you know, yeah. banks are not crazy about land, right? So mm -hmm. ultimately it's not producing, it's not performing. So mm -hmm. yeah, sever, pay off whatever portion of the land. Now is, is you know, is mortgaged by the bank. Now you have a piece of land sitting there. And again, there are different instruments you could use to go forward with this person. When in traditional land, like if you're looking to assemble land, traditionally, I think you would expect a lot of people to have, you know, decent sized mortgages on them, or, you know, something. So how often do you get to actually use a claim deed? I don't use it a lot because yeah. in most cases, I literally partner, joint venture partner with the, the property owner. And in the joint venture, it does state that the, the owner has agreed to act as a bare trustee for the beneficial interest of me, the partner, in a proportionate share of 50-50. Now, obviously there's no uh, mortgage on that. If there were a mortgage on that, we'd have to notify the bank of that. The bank would want me now to be, to be qualified on that mortgage. Keep in mind that it depends on where you go. Now, for instance, okay, this is Hamilton. So Hamilton houses were on, on the escarpment, let's say. Um, let's say before, by like concession to Fennel, those houses were built in the 50s and 60s, and then Fennel to, to Mohawk, I think there were 60s and 70s, and then from Fennel all the way back to Lime Ridge was 80s, 90s. Keep in mind that although young families do buy old houses, most people in certain areas are seniors, and they've had those houses for most of their lives, and those houses are long paid off. So I tend to always try to find areas where properties are actually uh, owned by somebody for a long time is paid off, and therefore, that senior owns a property and they can make a choice to, you know what, it's time for us to move on. Maybe it's time for us to use this piece of land that we've had, we're not doing anything with it. Uh, I can help them in both, in both cases, either buy the land or do something with them. The ideal situation sounds like is people who have like little to no mortgages right. and, is, and you're probably vetting land or properties to assemble based off of time of ownership likelihood. Yeah, because I'm, I'm really, I'm not a farmer, I'm really a hunter. As a real estate investor, I'm a hunter. I am a wolf, I'm a lion. So I go looking for specific areas or, or specific things. And I'll go to areas, like if I want a four level backsplit, I know they were made from 1972 to 1986. And where were they made? I'll go to the area, and I'll get that, you see? So I'm more, what do I need? When was it built? Where was it built? Let me go looking for what I need, as opposed to throwing everything up against the wall, driving around the whole city, yeah. trying to find something that, hey, I can't, I can't catch. A yeah. shark in Lake Ontario. The thinking yeah. process is literally find, anchor a couple of different areas and then right. you go there, look at the things like the what's been built in the area. What would the area need? What are the needs of the area? Mm -hmm. Now, it's very difficult for some people because, you know, I've been investing for 38 years and what happens is your ego builds up. And after a period of time, you feel invincible. And there's so many times that everything that I touch turned to gold. I was invincible. 
I could do anything. I even thought that I can have terrible partners and my ability will compensate for my terrible partners. And in every case I learned, I'm not invincible. I'm not a genius. Uh, all my years of experience doesn't give me a pass if I do something stupid. The world doesn't work that way. I have to humble myself and say to myself, okay, what do they need? Does it match what I need? Let's figure it out and, and make it happen. And everyone's on your side now. Yeah, usually the biggest yeah. issue is still the people, right? And, and that's, people. What, that's why yeah. we're actually very hesitant to get into the development world yeah. because uh, we looked around and we actually looked into many different options, but yeah. we don't like to be leaving that decision-making process to the city, which is right. another like yeah. a human being. Th there's place. variables there. Yeah, there's a lot of variables yeah. here. And that's why like, we, we, we looked into some like passive way to invest in other people's development project, yeah. uh, if they're credible and everything that we were considering. But uh, yeah, we, we just want to stay away from that. Yeah. How did you break through that kind of, uh, I guess, a limiting belief? It, it comes in stages. A lot of people think, you know, I'm here, I want to get to there, but we don't go from a baby to an adult. And therefore, your mind works the same way sometimes. But yes, you do have to shock yourself. If you're in grade 10 playing basketball, somebody should throw you into the NBA for a month. You're going to be terrible. But your scope opens up so much that when you get back to grade 10, now you're a superhero. It's a cakewalk, yeah. Right. But, you know, so in a sense, what you, what you want to do is literally say to yourself, okay, here's what I'm doing right now. Let me test myself in some other areas. And let me surround myself with some people in those areas who are doing what I want to do. Let me get a taste of it. And if it expands me, I won't know it expands me until I get back. And then once you get back to what you're doing, maybe three, four, five, six months later, things will work. I will say this to you. I always had a board of directors for me, not for a business per se. So at the time I was 24, I circled myself with four different people who I can turn to as my board of directors to keep me in check. Because again, sometimes I find that although I have ethics, uh, you can justify anything literally if you're a what rational you, person. If you, yeah, you can <laughs> rationalize anything. Yeah, right. So sometimes I have to go back and talk to my board of, personal board of directors and say to them, here's what I'm doing. What do you think? And then they'll say to me, no, you don't really need a $150,000 car. I'm like, but I need the car because it makes me look more credible and I can raise money if I look more credible. No, you just want the car. So stop lying to yourself. <laughs> if you want the car, just say you want the car. Don't lie to yourself. I'm not lying. Yes, you're lying. So you always need people to tell you, Stop lying to yourself and bending things to suit your needs. And you think it's just common sense, but it's not. So no, that's a mindset thing, and that is an experience thing, and that's a reality thing. Where I feel that when as people go on through the years, people have a way of either going one way or the other, either humbling and becoming more and more real, yeah. or becoming more and more disconnected with that's the right. world and themselves. That's right. And why they do things. That's why you have so many people who are working day to day, and they don't yeah. even know why they're doing it anymore. And they justify, "Oh, I'm doing it for my wife," and "Okay, I'm doing it for my family. I'm doing it for this." When they already accomplished that a while ago, and they're just doing it because this is they don't even know. Sometimes, right? They lie to themselves. And, and you know, it's so true. And uh, before we started uh, this chat today, you mentioned that uh, we talked about people on the 10th floor versus people on the second floor, right? Yeah. It's very important to consider that when I'm looking for investors. Now, now today I'm in a better place than I was when I, I first began, right? And therefore, people will come to me and say to me, I want you to invest in my project. And I'll say, okay. Then they'll say to me, here's the NOI, here's the return on investment, here is uh, the area. Wrong thing to start. They tell me all these things, but to me, mm. I don't care about that. I want to know, okay, how are you going to protect me liability-wise? Because on the 10th floor, if I'm getting sued, I have a long way to fall. And how are you going to protect me tax-wise? What, what is the tax treatment here? Because if it makes a lot of money, but I don't really take anything home, talk to me about that. Talk to me about your systems in place so that I know that uh, things are working even when you're not working. So tell me, how, 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 can, I, how can I exit a, a, a few times along the way? I want you to tell me about five or six different things ahead of time. Now you've earned the right to talk to me about all these other things. But when I was a beginner, I always thought people who were money uh, strong thought like me. No, I wanted your money. You know, the, the revenue made sense to me. The expenses made sense to me. But I had to get into their mindset, yeah. which was a, a difficult thing for me to transition to. But once I did, things started working out better for me for raising money for all sorts of things. I think that applies to several different levels along the way. I mean, even when it comes to uh, social economic class, when it comes to age, when it comes to... Uh, lifestyle that people lead, people think differently. And one of the things that I even noticed, like for example, I went, uh, I, was, I was visiting Singapore 
and I started to meet uh, some extended relatives who were relatively successful. Were actually not relative; they're quite successful. And then I realized they don't really like talking too much about business. They're interested <clears throat> in conceptually, but they talk about it differently. Right. Like the first thing before they talk about business, they need to like you as a person first. The way that you connect with people who are at that level would be different versus the way you connect for somebody who's just like, okay, listen, I don't have a lot of time. I have a job to do, and I need I need to make a buck. So explain to me the business plan. Let's just get straight into right. it. Right, people are different at different levels, and you have to be able to evaluate that. It's, it's so true. It's so yeah. true. It's very wise. Yeah. Yeah. Best way to do business, or or how we feel like uh, it was a, such a great business meeting, is usually we leave and then uh, yeah. without talking too much about the business. Yeah. Right. It's just a <laughs> like personal story. Right. We get to know each other, and then uh, you get to know like the each other's personality basically. Yeah. From there, you get to see whether or not this is a good relationship to even start off with. You shared a lot with us about the land development. What What was the most humbling experience you've had doing land development? You no, know, I would say that it was in Alberta. It was around the time when oil went from a hundred and Fifteen, one hundred and ten dollars a barrel, all the way down to about twenty, twenty-five to thirty-five dollars a barrel, and literally, I felt as though I've been telling people for years and years that this is the place to be, and I didn't realize that it's a cycle. You know, it's seven years up and a few years down. I had talked to some people about coming into an investment with me, and they came into one of my developments, and I found that I couldn't, I couldn't get it done on time, and I literally, although I didn't leave anybody behind, I literally had to go to my investors and say to them. It's going to be an extension. We're not going to get the the amount of money that we thought we thought, and I'm going to eat uh, some of the loss, but I'll get you your money back, but just above. And to me, it was very humbling because ultimately, I was a very exact person. You know, to, to the extent where if I'm looking at if if you're going to lay brick for me, I'm taking a look at you and see how you lay your brick. Now Alberta has really no brick, but I'm just saying uh, I'm very <laughs> I'm <laughs> very you know <laughs> very what, careful, right? Was it back uh, in 20? 16 in 2014 15 20, 16 the market just yeah just tanked uh, yeah and, i remember that and having to sure. face people that i was so confident of my, of what i was doing and have to say to them you know what no it's not going to happen the way we planned now fortunately they got their money back fortunately they got some benefit from it but is it really humbling because it was not when i was a beginner this happened when i was really good at investing so i didn't really have an excuse matthew you, you know? invest in so many different markets ontario mm -hmm. alberta yeah. arizona and belize yes. right which which place did you feel like is the easiest for development i would say alberta is probably well, no actually belize is the e easiest for development because the person who does your plans the architect that's the same person who comes and does all the testing of everything you've done there's not as much bureaucracy yeah no, <laughs> no. They're, they're the person who for the city will come and check and see you know how's your foundation how's your you know your framing and, and things like that right yeah um, i found alberta is always uh less red tape and uh I, i've enjoyed enjoyed that but i found that city to city it's different like here in ontario i would say welland is a phenomenal building department mm -hmm. uh they're they're open to you do anything so welland's great i will not say a name but there's areas close to Welland that I think are not as nice. Mm -hmm. They are, you know, tough to work with. So sometimes it's even city to city. People always ask me, why not just do one strategy and why not just stay in one area? Because I've been investing for so long and there's been so many market up and downs that I've gone through, I had to fold the caribou. So if I wanted to, let's say, just to buy, like Burr, buy, fix, and rent, that worked for a period of time. But back in those days, properties were appreciating 5% a year. And interest rates were like 6 or 7%. And appraisers were very, very conservative. So you couldn't buy a property, fix it up, and then turn around within a year and pull money out. It just wouldn't, it wouldn't happen. So for a season or two, like five seasons, that worked. And then I had to go to more buy, fix, sell because that's how I had to make money. And then wholesaling worked for a period of time. Then tax sales worked for another period of time. Then rent to owns worked. So I literally didn't decide to start going to different places and doing different strategies. As a person who's hunting for deals, I had to follow the buffalo, follow the caribou, and use strategies that worked in the time frames that they worked in. You know, so right now Burr is probably not doing what it did a few years ago. It will again, but maybe not today. Yeah. Are you still implementing different strategy, or are you just kind of focused on the development right so now? So right now, um, I, I do multifamily buildings. So I'm <clears> looking right now at a, a 12 building, 190 unit. A portfolio um, in uh, New Brunswick. Is and that like turnkey or? It's turnkey. Yeah. And the reason why I'm looking for turnkey is I'm not young, right? Number one. <laughs> no, I, actually, I buy these properties, put them in a portfolio so that four or five years later, I can bore against them. I can use that money to buy my own land out of my own pocket. Mm. I don't want to go to the bank when I need them. So a bank is going to give you a 50% financing on land. So most of the time I buy land, it's half the money out of my portfolio, half the money is the vendor, 
the seller of the land, give me a VTB, then I put my own money out of my own pocket to do site plan approval. So if it's a million dollar piece of land, half a million dollar site plan approval, now I'm shovel ready. And now I go to the bank at the top of the hill. And when I go to the bank at the top of the hill, they treat you really, really nice. As opposed to bank, can I have money to buy the land? Can I have money to site plan approve? I'd rather use my portfolio. Now, if I'm not doing development and I'm renovating a building or converting a building from, uh, let's say, commercial to residential, not apartments, but condos, so I can sell half the condos, get my money back, I use my portfolio. Mm -hmm. So I do multifamily to create a portfolio to be able to borrow against in order to actually do some of the other things that I want to do. That play, that's actually a long-term play. It's a long-term play. Right? And it sounds like development is actually, tech, even though it's a three-year, it's yeah. technically mid to sh short to midterm play. And what's the fastest that you can run through one of those development deals? To make money. If I build one house, I'm not making money. If I build six houses, okay, I'm making some money. You know, it's going to take a year to get site plan approved yeah. and maybe nine months to build, depending on how efficient you are. Okay. So really, we're looking at three years to three to four years for most projects, but about three years. Okay. And the fastest yeah. you can get done, you're saying, is about two. If I, I think about two. Yeah. If I can get land purchased and site plan approval done in one year, I will sell that. You know, <laughs> yeah, no. I'll sell four of those before I build doing, anything. Yeah. And you're not doing any shorter term plays in two years, I guess. That's right. Because okay. you know what? Money's I, made, I think, in two to three years. <laughs> yeah. No, it's true. it's true. I don't mind working hard. I do have a girlfriend. And she likes a back rub and she likes softer hands. So ultimately, I'm not going to work with bricks and you know, anymore, right? Yeah, 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 <laughs> right. yeah. I'm not going to do the, the yeah. mixing concrete. You yeah, know? but I like your strategy because you're not putting yourself in a position where you're over leveraged. A lot of developers that we're seeing is that they do the, they have the traditional mortgage on lanes, right? right? And then they also do, they also try to do pre-sale, getting the construction uh, loan. And then on top of that, they also do the maze loan, like to, to kind of bridge yes. that. Yes. So I the moment that they, they're not able to, uh, or they're trying to sell it at a different market, now they're super over, over leveraged. That's right. And that's why a lot of companies actually go bankrupt. Yeah. So, so what I do a lot is something called option to purchase when it comes to land, right? And instead of buying a piece of land for a million dollars, a purchase and sale agreement, I buy the land. It's now my land. Now I wait five years to use it, wait three years to use it. I do something called option to purchase where when I talk to the landowner, they're not ready to leave yet. They may have two or three more years before they leave. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll give them an option where, listen, this is a piece of, this is a million dollars. We'll give it simple. And I'll give you an option of uh, 250000 bucks, which means we agree upon a future price. Today, it's, two, it's $1 million. We'll buy it for one3 They're okay with that. Uh, by the time I buy, it's probably worth $2 million. But farmers don't tend to, let's say, project high <coughs> because there are people who live by every year. Yeah. Every year, what is the weather like every year? I'm fair with them. But ultimately, I have the option to buy the land for $1.1 million. Today, it's value. I have the option to buy it for $1.3. I'll leave a deposit of, let's say, $200,000, non refundable. If I don't buy their land, I lose my deposit, right? If I buy the land, then all of a sudden I have that $1.3 piece of uh, property, $1.3 million piece of property, but I'm not buying it right now and tying my money up. If you came to me and offered me mm. uh, a price on my property, yeah. let's say, and you offered it to me three years down the road or yeah. five years down the road, What's really my incentive, do you think, or how do you convince me to accept that versus to just say, I'll wait for three to five years and then I'll sell it, I'll list it when the time comes? Okay, so very important what you said, if you come to me, right? So I wouldn't go to you because you're not in the same position of a farmer who has given you know, so many years of his or her back. They can't predict the future because they only live year by year. Mm -hmm. Next year's crop could die or not, right? They can't see the future. You can so therefore, they want to guarantee the future. If I can guarantee a farmer three years of good weather, they'll take it. So that's who I'm dealing with. So from their mindset, to give them a guarantee that three years from now, they can actually retire, they know what they're getting, they can actually plan for their future three years in advance, and how to dispose of that property, who it goes to, to them, that is gold. So when you're talking about this anecdotally, when you're saying the farmer, you don't mean literally farmers. You're talking about people who want, who would like somebody to give them a roadmap or a plan for the future that they can Correct. bank on, Correct. rather than them having to create their own future, yeah. so to speak. But with land, I do talk to farmers. But okay. I'm just, I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah. Ultimately, it's the same as big buildings. You know, if, if I'm buying a big building, I'm talking to the owner, and let's say he or she's about, um, like, so let's say he's 72, his wife's probably 68. Their kids went to school on that building, that multifamily building, and the kids don't want anything to do. Kids being, meaning 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds, kid, their kids. This older couple, they're still cleaning the building because he is so exact. He cannot pay a property manager. No one can keep the building as clean as he wants to. And if you go into the workroom, you'll see he's got little 
jars, baby jars full of bolts, mismatched bolts, because he doesn't want to lose anything because he grew up in a war. Ultimately, she's too tired, arthritis. He's getting up in age. They want to move on. They don't want to give the property to the kids, but they want to give the property to the kids' kids. At the same time, they can't have somebody else manage it because no one could run it like they can. And now they find somebody who is, okay, I'm like you 30 years ago. I want to raise my kids on this property and let's find a way where you can hold a mortgage for the next five years where ultimately we can port that uh, profit into, into your grandkids. So I'm just saying people have all different scenarios and I just listen to their scenarios and see if I can work around it. For the lands that you're doing the option to buy, do you also negotiate a term where you can actually start the rezoning process with the city? Okay, so in that option, uh, you can ask for anything you want and they can say no to it. But if I want to do some rezoning work, then I, I can have the, the landowner then sign on uh, to give me permission to speak on their behalf until that property becomes my property. Even when I do option to purchase, I always have the right to assign because sometimes they don't want to sell that property to a large company, but I'm not a large company and they will sell it to me and I'll try to do something with it. But if I can't, then I can assign it, wholesale it to a larger company. And, but they still get what they're looking for yeah. in, in the process. Now, I don't use a lot of options, but I'm just saying it's one process instead of buying five pieces of land and land banking, holding on to money, tying it up in land. If I can do an option, if it's possible, not everybody will take it, but if it is possible, then I'll, I'll implement that as well. Okay. So for development, who needs to be on your power team? A lot of development is is, is your attitude and how you look at things, right? Now, obviously, um, you, you're going to have to have your HVAC person. You're going to have to have your plumber and your electrician. You're going to discover that these three people generally have the biggest egos. Why do they have the biggest egos? Because they need the biggest space, even in the house. So these guys generally, not everybody, but generally have a massive ego. And then you have to deal with them, then working with the rest of the trades. Now the framer, here's the big problem. Framing is a hard thing to do. You'll discover that a lot of framers, you know, don't have 15 years experience where you have a lot of trades that have 15 years experience. And the person who's framing probably has like three years of experience. They're taking this two dimensional flat thing and trying to make it into three dimensions. So the guy who has two or three years of ability is the one who everybody depends on now, trying to solve a problem because framing is solving a problem. Whereas electrical is pretty straightforward, so is plumbing, and so is your HVAC. Now, if the framer doesn't get it right, everybody below that person, the, the drywall, drywall guy is mad. I can't put my screws it's the anywhere. Bones. It's the bones, right? Yeah, yeah. I kept, where am I going to put the screws? The guy didn't uh, leave a spot to put my screws, right? So you'll find that everybody else complains about the first three. And I find it's almost like, um, like, like life imitates high school. But what I do is once I assemble all my team and it's hard to get them all together in one room. And I will say that if I have plans, everybody has to take the plans home at some point. They go through the plans. They report to me what problems they see and who else they need to talk to to resolve those problems before it ever goes to ground. But what I do is once I have my team, I, I invite them out for a buffet, buffet lunch. So it might be Saturday, 3.30 to 6.30, and everybody comes together and they, they eat. And I do that because I want to know what you put in your plate in a buffet. Yeah. If you're going to have, let's say, a lot of food right now on your, on your plate, guess what? You know it's a buffet, right? You're going to order a lot of material up front. You're going to piss me off because building is about air and water. Too much air and water in the soil, too much air and water in the concrete, too much air and water in the wood, too much air and water in the drywall, too much air and water insulation, too much air and water everywhere else. So if you load up the plate, you're going to buy a lot of material up front. If you have three different meats on your plate, some chicken, some fish, and some, uh, you know, like meat, chicken, and fish, why would you put all three meats on your plate? So I watch them carefully to see how they, you know, like how they fill their plates. And I'm watching them. And there's a lot of other things I look for as well, but it sort of tells me who they are as a person. If they just get a plate and they just eat one thing at a time, they don't put their, their potatoes, mix it with their peas, mix it with the jello. Some people put dessert in with meat. It tells you a lot about people and building is really about people, right? <laughs> yeah. To answer your question, th th that's what I do. I make sure I understand who I'm working with. Yeah. And if somebody ends up taking two plates at one time and sitting down, they go home. 
<laughs> okay, so if we ever get invited to a buffet, we need to like. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Watch how you eat. Pings, exactly. pings, pings in trouble, right? He loves exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah, I might just go there. I might just show up hungry, you know. But I still <laughs> got like, that. I still not, gotta it's watch not myself. How much you eat? It's the order you eat it in, right? You've already given me so many things to talk about, but like actually, the one thing I remember is I had this one friend. I, you know how sometimes you have a center plate, everybody's sharing. It's like, hey, yeah. does anybody want the last piece? Yeah. Sometimes you have a group of friends where one guy's just like, yes, and they take the last piece, right? <laughs> yeah. And I remember thinking the first time I saw them, it's like, wow, this really says actually something about a person's character about this, right? It's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just a thing, right? It's true. I, I would just say one thing. So how do I translate that into the real world, right? Yeah. Let's say I'm watching somebody, you know, I want you to lay, lay brick for me. Yeah. If I see them put the brick on the mud <laughs> and they scrape the excess off and let it hit the ground, by the time you're done a house, that's about nine bags of mortar you just scraped off the edge. But if you scrape it off and put it on the front end, now at least that butter, that mortar is on the front end of the brick for the next brick. Now, that's minor, but if somebody's gonna waste my mortar, they're gonna waste everything else. And it's just a, a behavior, okay? So there are certain things you could look at for every trade yeah. as you watch them working, and it's just three things each. And you see how they deal with those things? And after a while, you realize, okay, I don't wanna hire these people. It could be a good resume, but right. it doesn't really matter. So based on how they eat, how they eat? You might actually change to a different company. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually very funny. You know, it's funny because yeah. you know I know we're talking a lot about real estate, but you know what, Matthew? Yeah. Every time, every time I hear you talk, it kind of makes me realize a little more and more that while you are in the business mm -hmm. of real estate, you are actually in the business of people. It's people business. The amount of things that you understand, because even when we talk to other people about how to do sales, how to negotiate. Yeah. There, are, you've you're clearly demonstrating that there is a plethora of considerations going on in your mind that people don't. How do you even teach people to think about these things and to make these connections, right? When you're evaluating somebody and to as to their character, because even when people are investing with you, do you ever wonder are they investing in your business plan or are they investing in you? It's true, and you'll discover that I, I've discovered that in the beginning they came because of the opportunity, but they stayed because of me, and they came back because of me because they know that I'm careful. Even if I give you give them a little story about the, uh, the mortar, yeah. they're like, oh, you, you look out for things. See, they want to know that I look out for their money. Yeah. If, I, if I look out for me, I look out for their money. And yeah. it's, it's really important to them, right? And your interests are aligned, yeah. And, and you're right, it is a people situation. Do you hire a project manager or you manage the projects yourself? Yeah, so sometimes I, I, I'll order the project manager. So in most cases, I'll get a, a general contractor and a site supervisor. Um, because I really don't want to go out there. I mean, I learned to build in Alberta, which meant I flew out there 15 days a month on the job site with the company. And again, I couldn't find anybody here to help me, to teach me how to build. Uh, they kept it to themselves. Oh, you were part of the building process at this time. Well, you know what? I was never a builder. Uh, yeah. I did renovate a lot of my properties, but I, when I wanted to go get into building, I was talking to different companies to see, hey, can I get some trade secrets? Uh, nobody gave me trade secrets. And I ended up looking for pulling title on properties that were developed. And I pulled title at Land Title Land Registry to see how they financed it. And sometimes a developer might go to a certain group or even a multifamily building, go to a group, get the initial money from them. And I was looking out in Alberta and I saw that a certain company would go to the same little group of doctors to fund their money for all their projects. And I said to them, you know, you guys are limited only to this one little group why don't I come out there and show you guys how to raise money from other people? And they're like, don't come out. And I'm like, okay. And that was a Thursday. And by Tuesday, I jumped on WestJet. So I was living in Ancaster, flew out there. And I said, listen, I just flew three and a half hours. That's over 3,000 kilometers. I want one hour of your time. I'm going to show you guys how to raise money from strangers. But what you have to do is give me six months of time with you on the job sites because I need to understand your culture. I'm not going to raise money for you if I don't know your culture. And to understand your culture, it means I have to be in the boardroom, I have to be on the job site, I gotta come out here. And what I need from you guys is to pay me 5,000 a month, pay for my flight, pay for my hotel, pay for um, my car, I'll take care of my food for 15 days a month. And they're like, boy, you're bold. I go, yeah, because fortune favors the bold. And they liked it. So ultimately, that's how I started uh, with this company in uh, Alberta. And in my first year, I think I raised a million. My second year, I raised half a million. And my third year, about 26 million. That worked out really well. Yeah, yeah. That story, it's powerful. It's strong. You know, people, and I think, I think people will understand that, you know, fortune favors the bold. It's actually correct. You know, if you don't take a swing, you know, what is it? Even in sports, they say you miss however many percentage of shots you don't right. take, right? So you have to take a shot. But I wonder, how many times have you tried something like that and it blew up in your face? It's percentages. Yeah. So when I first began bold, this started for me uh, as a you know, 19, 20-year-old 
going to nightclubs and trying to ask someone to dance. That's where it starts. And they say no, right? So, you know, you have to take your, your licks with you, right? In the end, I, I would say the beginning, I would say nine out of 10 times it was a no. And as I built confidence in myself to realize that it doesn't matter if it's a no, I'm still who I am. Uh, once that level of fear, anxiety, and doubt and rejection dropped a bit, I found that it was like 50%, 50-50, I was getting exactly whatever I, I, I went for. And today I'd probably say I'm at uh, probably a 60%, 70%. Mm. When I call building owners who have properties not for sale, seven out of 10 times because how I talk to them or how I approach them, they literally say, okay, you know what? I get calls every day, uh, but I'll, I'll entertain a conversation with you. But that comes in time. So in the beginning, yeah, f a lot of failure. Yeah. But as time went on, it, it, it changed a bit. There was a guy I spoke to, he was, he was actually uh, hosting a seminar and I ha was having a private conversation with him afterwards. And he said something to me to the effect of, if you are good at talking to women, the skill set that you need is actually not too different in sales. It's, it's just, true. you know, you're targeting a different interest maybe, but yeah. the muscles that are there mm -hmm. for understanding what they want and yeah. being able to speak to speak to their interest yeah. is actually the same. And I was yeah. thinking about it, I'm like, wow, it all comes back to this numbers game of like just getting it in is. there, having the courage to talk and trying to speak to their interests. Yeah. Uh, Women are marketing, really guys are sales, right? Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> the only way to get good, you have to do a lot of that. And another thing too, it's uh, a lot of people talk about the, their why today, you know, what's your why, what's your why, right? And people always ask me that, you know, what's my why? You know, my why is what it is, but uh, how to get there is my rocket ship, which has been real estate. Mm -hmm. See, real estate's good and your why is good, but what I found over the, over the last decades is that the fuel that I needed to go from stage to stage changed. So because I came to Canada in 72, and you know, being different, looking different was not the easiest thing. And everybody had their own issues. I had a lack of self-confidence. I felt second class. Mm -hmm. And I used that as a, I'm going to show them that I'm not. And that was my fuel up until I was 29 years old. That's a lot of fuel for a lot of people, actually. Yeah. So I put that in my rocket. So it's not just the, your why. It's not just your vehicle, your rocket, but what, what are you burning? But what surprised me, when I was 29 years old, that fuel burnt out because I didn't feel second class anymore. And I had to go and find another fuel. And for about six years, my fuel was nice things. I wanted to have the nicest car, the biggest house. I wanted to you know, go to Chicago, spend 20 grand on an evening. So I splurged a bit. I'm not saying that people should do it, but I did it to get to the point where I realized that it doesn't make me happy. You always want the bigger thing, but I got it out of my system. Now, I'm okay with nice things today. The bottom line is I don't need it, but I'm okay with it. And that burnt out after six years. And then I had to find another fuel and another fuel. So people think, you know what? My why is going to get me there? And real estate's my rocket? Well, guess what? It's your fuel and it's going to burn out. But make sure you burn your bad fuel first. So I burnt my second class citizen yeah. stuff first. I burnt out my desire to have the nicest things second and then on onwards. It's you know, important. It's interesting you say it like yeah. that too, because I think a lot of people look at that fuel because sometimes yeah. people, for example, they get out of a bad relationship. Right. Something happens, you know, that doesn't make them feel good. And then they have this, as you call it, the fuel right. that if you just leave it there, it's going to, you know, go bad. It's going to sour. That's it's going to sour you. Yes. But the whole thing about it is that you can either use it, burn it, or I think some people also just go and throw it away. Yeah. But it's actually, in fact, interesting because throwing it away is actually good if you have enough things maybe going for you. You don't need yeah. that fuel for anything great. But it's actually, put, it's, it's very combustible, Yeah, right? Yeah. It can push you. So it's I think true. I think that's really good. Where did you get a healthy mindset? I was not popular in high school. So therefore I used to listen and watch, right? And you know, a lot of guys who were very popular in high school, by the time they got to college, they, they burnt out. I had a chance to look at people and listen and learn. And therefore I always had that, that attitude of, you know, it's not about me only, it's about understanding other people. And I strive for that. And that sort of helped me in, in the beginning to go there. I'll tell you something else. Like, I, I just gave you a story about the fuel and then you gave me a, a little small off to the side. What if you have fuel and what if you don't use it? See, that's why I talk to people like you. The fact is I learn a lot more about myself when I'm talking to guys who are a little bit younger who are doing amazing things. And when I share what I'm doing and then you guys take it, you add whatever you add to it. And when it comes back to me, I'm like, oh my God, I never thought about that. So it's important for me to hang out with people who um, are in the game even, um, you know, like I said, I'm 38 years in the game, but I'm not going to stay in this game if I don't hang out with people like you guys who are, who are cutting edge 
and uh, you see things a fresh way. To answer your question, that's what motivates me. So what drives you right now other than the networking aspect? Because obviously you're doing like some like uh, multi-family and then, uh, development stuff, right? All of those type of projects usually come with stress. At the current stage of your life right now, I would assume a lot of people would want to try to like play a little safer. Why are you still trying to like- gain What's your like, why now? Yeah, yeah. what's your yeah, why? Yeah. So yeah, a few reasons, right? That, that's a good question. Yeah. So a, a few, <laughs> few reasons. Um, I don't play as aggressive as I used to. In other words, I'll do smaller projects, not 113 house subdivisions, but smaller to stay in the game. Um, I'm a teacher, so I like to teach. That's why I still do some coaching or some mentoring. You know, even, even um, the most successful singer today still writes songs because like Taylor Swift, I'm sure she's successful. She has her own island, but she still makes music because it's her thing. Mm -hmm. So I like teaching and I like growing and learning. That's my thing. I will say this to you that over the last two years, my dad, he's 89, we, we got a 15-footer boat, and we, we brought it back. It's a beautiful boat that we brought back. People say to me, why, why don't I just buy like a $2 million yacht or something? Well, that's possible, but spending two years with my dad renovating or restoring a, a boat with my dad at 89 years old, like to me, that's the billion dollars right there. And I can always just charter a boat wherever it is and use it for a, a week or two if I need to. So it's really understanding what's real. So my why is to spend time with my daughter, she's 15. My new why now is to invent something called powdered water, which doesn't exist. So water in powder form, mm. right? And I've been researching that for about six months now. Uh, if I never invent it, I might invent a bit of chewing gum from it, who knows? But I am <laughs> looking at you know, you know, to taking hydrogen and encapsulating it in, in, silica, in silica, sand, and then a chemical, dry oxygen and bring them together. Now, why am I doing that? Just because, and I can, and I will. And to like reach your potential. Yeah. It's almost like, why do I do it? It's because this is who I am. It's who I am. <laughs> it's who I am. I do yeah. it because it's what I do. Well, you, you know, know? It's, it's interesting. When you describe yourself, especially, it's like, I'm a hunter. I'm a wolf. I'm yeah. a lion, right? That's and right. Uh, this almost becomes part of your identity, part of your nature. Yes. Right? And then, you know, even as, you know, lions, wolves age, you know, they still fund there's still some fundamental things I think people have to do. That's yes. why I think you see some people who aim for retirement. They work hard for however many years, and then they hit a point where they can retire. And it's like, okay, well, now what I do. And they still end up doing the same thing they did before, but they yes. just don't do it because they have to, they do it because they want, they want to. to. So, you know, like being an entrepreneur, there's always a different ideas, right? And yeah. uh, the ideas is usually more than what we can execute. So yeah. after a while we get burned out, right? Like you mentioned, like after a while, like you, you, you need to redefine your why, but yeah. how do you actually recharge in between those years? You know, I recharge on a daily basis. So I have like little triggers, little routines, right? Um, you know, I wake up and right now I'm learning Spanish. Why am I learning Spanish? Because it creates more real estate in your brain. Is your girlfriend Spanish? Uh, no, she's not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning Spanish because what it does, it causes your brain to be more dense because I'm learning a different language. So part of my recharge is, is my behavior. You know, I wake up, I'm learning a, a language. I'll learn a new one next year. Um, you know, I drink my cinnamon tea. And then ultimately, I read a verse from the Bible called Proverbs um, because it's about wisdom. And then I do my exercise. And then literally, I go for a little walk. And then I start my day. Um, I live today for today, although I learned from the past and I, I'm excited for tomorrow. If I walk by something that's interesting, I'll, I'll make sure I notice it. So I find that I recharge by living today for today. In other words, you know, speaking about girlfriends, uh, my last girlfriend I broke up with, we went, we went to Italy. We're walking on these cobblestones that were like 2,000 years old. And I'm saying, do you see the cobblestones? Somebody handmade those. Yeah. She's like, so what? Well, I like to enjoy where I am and the moment that I'm in. So my recharging is just getting up and enjoying my moment. My recharging is getting up and enjoying my moments. Right. Yeah. You're using a daily yeah. habit to kind of recharge you. It's, to a, da obviously. it's a daily habit to recharge <clears throat> daily as opposed to waiting for a vacation. Well, you know, actually yeah. being able to do that, I can see how that's recharging. You don't have to have, I think, anything too specific, you know, because yeah. people even say that, you know, those who live in the future live in stress and, yeah. and those who live in the past live in fear. Those yes. who live in the present live in peace. Right? It's beautiful. And if you can live, to, live today in peace, yeah. you will actually be in the moment. Because like right now is actually perfectly fine. Yeah. But the minute I start thinking about tomorrow, there's stress. It's the true. minute I start looking at what happened in the past, I might yeah. feel bad. Right. So it's like it's good to be able to do that. I think that's a that that is actually a recharge element that I feel a lot of people need to figure out how yeah. to do for themselves. Get out of their heads and be in the moment. You said you're currently doing mentorships still, right? Yeah. And you're and uh, do you find that the age demographic is a younger generation, middle age? Like where do you find that the majority of people are you can't put people into categories, but I do find that younger investors, like let's say 19 to about 25, 26, they need more of the, uh, a certain amount of motivation and they need to have a group of people who are doing something as well. Gym buddies. Gym buddies, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's important for them. And you know, 
you can go to these events and you can have all these gym buddies, which is great. But after a while, you're like, I, I want more meat. I want, I want more specifics. And I'm not looking to network as much, but I want to get detail by detail by detail what I need. So I tend to mentor people who are at the point where they're like, okay, you know what? I want some more detail. And I also mentor people that I think that if I ever mentor somebody, it's because I think that person will take whatever I teach them, add it to their existence, and become a better person. I'm not going to spend time with somebody who I believe is going to just take what I have and waste it, mm. you know, because in the end, it, I earned it. It took me a lot of years to get it. So if ever I've mentored somebody, it's because I, I respect that person and uh, I see that person has potential greater than, you know, what I had. Well, to yeah. that, actually, what, what would you say then is one of the biggest setbacks that young people have when they come to you looking to improve themselves? Two things. One, uh, they want things done in a year. And it's, it's past, very yeah. difficult to get things done in a year. We all want things done in a year. And I remember when I was 21 years old, I was part of Rotary International. And they were saying that in the next three years, we're going to raise money for a, uh, an x-ray machine for Thailand. I'm like, three years? What are you Who's guys, got time crazy? for crazy? <laughs> like three years is like an eternity. Yeah. What the hell are you talking about? Raise money for an x-ray machine three years from now. So even me, I understand that, right? Three years was like a lifetime. Um, so I think it's, it's understanding that um, things, things do take some time sometimes to set the foundation. A lot of young people tend to compare themselves to most. No, sorry, they, they compare themselves to the best. In other words, they look at, here's the best person doing this, the best person doing that, and I don't match up. But even having a high school degree or diploma, even a high school diploma is most than, most than most of the world. So they have to understand that I have a diploma, my base is that wide. You know, I'm a good person, I raise my kid, my base is that wide. I actually go to work, my base is that wide. And now something great happened and I can handle it. But if they see themselves, yeah, I got a high school diploma, that's nothing. And yeah, you know, I got one house, two houses, that's nothing. And this is nothing, and this is nothing. The moment something big happens, the base is so tiny, they topple. So a lot of young people don't appreciate that compared to the most of the world, they're what they so-called call crappy life. And their, their simple achievements are massive achievements compared to the world and compared to time over the last 2,000 years. They have to begin to see it that way. And that's better for them. Yeah, it's also the social media, right? A lot of people social are seeing the, the lifestyle because that's, yeah. what, that's what sells. The lies, yeah. right? The, <laughs> yeah, lies. the lifestyle. It's true. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> the lifestyle. Yeah. Young people do have this, uh, I think, almost unrealistic expectations of themselves, right? Yeah. And uh, this because they're buying into it. It's almost like, you know, especially a lot of young guys too, they TikTok or any kind of social media has become sort of the cosmo of what was for girls, right? Yeah. The, uh, back in the day. And they subscribe to this thing. Like people who tell people, if you're not making $20,000 a month, you're wasting your time. Yeah. Like twenty thousand dollars is a lot of money, right? Yeah. Like, you no, know, but if so. you had twenty thousand dollars a month, could you handle it? Yeah. Most people can't. That's why you have to to ramp up to it, right? Uh, do you still offer one on one, or right now you're doing I, the? I, I, I do, promotion? but I probably mentor probably about eight people a year. I see um, one on one, and um, but my one on one is I I go on the job site. I mean, I I go look at buildings with them. I talk to the owners with them. I talk to the people who have properties not for sale mm -hmm. because I still I enjoy that. So I do it partially because I love doing it still, yeah. you know? Um, so that's why I do the one-on-one. -on -one. I, don't, I, I don't think, I don't have an issue with somebody who is a part of a large group and they're getting group, group coaching, yeah. but I get more gratification as a teacher if I'm hanging out with that person, we're grabbing lunch, we're discussing what we just did, we're gonna drive a city together, I, I think I think I, I grow and they grow better from oh, that. Oh, for sure. One-on-one because yeah. it's more custom, right? And also yeah. like they get to see you, like even like when when yeah. I was like with you, uh, you're actually one of the, my my very first coaches. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. Wow. And then uh, yeah. when I was like watching how you move, how you talk, how you negotiate, that was like, that was a really eye-opening for me. That's important actually. Yeah. Now, th it's not a money-making system if you're just mentoring four or five people, but I'm not looking to to depend on mentoring as my main source of income. So therefore, I don't have to mentor 100 people. Interesting you say it like that because there are people who need to do a lot of mentorship because that is actually the primary avenue of business. Yeah. But for, so there, are, there are people who are actually doing real estate, who are yeah. actually teaching yeah. what they do yeah. in real life because I sometimes wonder how these people teach real estate and it seems like all they're doing is teaching and then they don't actually have, the, I, I don't know when they find the time to do real estate. Well, you really don't, because I remember in 1998 to about 2006, I was an international speaker. So I would fly one weekend to BC, 
next weekend to Alberta, next yeah. weekend to Saskatchewan, next weekend to, you know, Cape Cod, Florida. And the fact is, I didn't have time to do real estate. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I was making, as a speaker, um, we sold trainings and, you know, I would probably make $30,000 that weekend. Yeah. So when you're making $30,000 by flying and talking, yeah. to then go and buy a house, fix it and sell it, and then make 60,000 bucks, you're like, geez, you know what? Three weekends of work, yeah. I can, uh, my hand stays off and I can literally make the same amount of money, except that it's cash. It's not uh, appreciating. It's not uh, like, like buying a house. It's a different kind of a job almost. Right? Different kind of a job, different yeah. concept, yeah. you know, and then it becomes competitive. It is a very interesting time right now with uh, the market going the way it is, right? And we, we, we heard somebody say this and we, it resonates so true, which is that people who are bad at real estate investing in the good market became good real estate investors. Good real estate investors being great real estate investors. Great real estate investors made a killing in the yeah. real estate market that just passed. But right now as the market's shifting down, People who were good became bad. People who were great became good. And everybody shifted back down. Exactly. Right. Which means, actually, I think this opens up a lot of opportunity, especially for somebody like you, because one mm. of the things you have clearly demonstrated is that you understand people. You're creative. You know how to right. think. And somebody else who we're speaking to pointed out that the most valuable thing that somebody can have in today's real estate market is, to, is the ability to think and be a little creative. Yes. In order to be a creative, though, you have to be able to understand the problem. Yes. You have to be able to find, understand the problem and come up with a creative solution to that problem because not everything is straightforward. And you, now there's a lot of negotiating power for would-be real estate investors. So the skill sets that you can pick up on, even when you're saying that you notice that they have like a jar of bolts, yeah. you know, and the things <laughs> that they keep, these are little things that say a lot about a person, right? And if you can figure out things about the person and understand what they want, you can figure out what you can give them and how to make that deal happen. And in the one-on-one -on -one coaching session, you can teach that critical thinking. Yes. Right, where I think it's very challenging to teach it otherwise. No, it, it's so critical because even my negotiations, I look at it as a bridge. Mm -hmm. When I call somebody for their building or house or anything, literally, I tell them, I love what you have. I surrender, I give up. I, I want it, I love it, it's perfect, it's beautiful. I really want it, so I'm at 100% I want it. They don't even think of selling it, so they kind of don't want to sell it. Now, as I continue talking to them, now we're halfway across the bridge, they're thinking of selling it. They're thinking of what they can do with that money. And I'm thinking, maybe I don't want it so much. And then by the time I get to the end of that negotiation, I want it, maybe I do, maybe I don't, but they really want to sell it. Like I have a gentleman who is trying to sell me a building for $11 million because his dad wanted $11 million, right? I'm like, it's worth five and a half. But uh, I'll tell you something, how old are you? He goes, 36. I go, how long has it been in your family? He says, I'm 10 years. I go, why aren't you developing this property? He goes, I'd love to do that, but I, I'm not a developer. I go, then what we do here is uh, buy the building. You provide a massive VTB. You come on as a partner, a silent partner, to watch the development process. And at least this gives you a chance to do something more exciting than what you're doing. He's like, I always wanted to be a developer. And you know, the guy's been calling me once a week for the last, I think, two months, and I just be slowing him down. Okay, I'll get to it. I'll get to it. Because now we're on the other side of the bridge where maybe I want to buy it, maybe I don't. And he's like, I really want to do this thing. So negotiation is a bridge. And I find that uh, if you use that, it, it really helps you to get, get what you need or achieve what, what you want to achieve. Yeah, you're trying to like yeah. give other people a vision. A and vision then, of what they need. Yeah. And then uh, after they bought it, you're like, uh, okay, now let me think about it. Let me think about it. <laughs> Slowly but surely. You know what? Yeah. 11 million, I think it's more you know, 5.5 million. Yeah, but it he, becomes more reasonable. <laughs> yeah, but but I, had, I had to accept his eleven million dollars to begin with. Exactly, but here's the thing, thing, though: a lot of people didn't can even finish the the walking through that bridge. They right. they get to the halfway, and all of a sudden they're chasing the deal. They want to, they want that deal to be closed. We always advise people to just you know what, if you want to like, don't just aim for the trophy deal. Try to get in, pick up your momentum. Trophy deal will come. It's so true yeah. what you just said there. And if they want to learn, they can just sit and watch a cat hunt, like a, a regular cat, you know, on the grass. They'll slowly move towards something, they'll pause, slowly move towards it, slowly move towards it. In the end, if they move slow enough, they'll get the grasshopper. And for me, although I want this deal, I have to manage my expectations because I do not want to create that energy and put it onto the other side, right? That's why I say, I, I love it, I surrender. Now they are open because I respect them. I respect what you have, I respect your price. Now let's see if we can make that price happen. If we can't, it's because of the government or because of the landlord board or because of rents, or because of this, or because of that, because your property just isn't what we thought it was. You know, it's unfortunate, because I was telling you, I'll pay what you want. It's the situations that has caused the issues, and it's unfortunate. But you know? you're, you're painting a picture where people can work together. 
Right, well, that's, together. that's the thing is yes. that you're it's a little bit of give and take sometimes uh people is. people can get what they want very often it's just are they willing to work with you so that you can give them what they want with the market shifting a lot of people will have questions about how they should adjust you know young real estate investors older real estate investors people have this question so like how do you coach someone through the current circumstance of the market well i tell people that you know don't look at real estate like you're a a, a collector like an anti-collector because some people buy their real estate and they never want to sell it Everything they buy, they keep. I tell them, look at it more as a general manager of a baseball team. Because ultimately, uh, you might have somebody on second base and you're at the bottom of the ninth, it's a tied score, and the batter comes up and he's about to bat. He wants a home run. But you know what? Sometimes that property has to be sold. So he might do a sacrifice bunt just to get second base player to the third base. The next person up, they want to hold that property. They want to just uh, hit a home run. Sometimes you have to tell them, sacrifice, fly that. Pop that up far enough so that when somebody catches it, the third baseman can run all the way to, uh, to, to home and plow through the, and plow through the pitcher. Yeah. You know, so it's really moving the player. And if sometimes you have to sell a property to move the player, it's not about shame. It's not about pain. It's not about cost. Sometimes you got to sacrifice a player to get your family to where you need to go. Mm -hmm. Sometimes mid-season, you got to hire a high high heat pitcher. Yeah. I may bring in an opportunity just to prove a point and then sell it after yeah. so that other people will invest with me. It is really a take two take one step back to take two steps forward kind That's of right. thing, right? That's yeah. right. And also a lot of times that when your funds get stuck into your real estate and you have no way to actually pull it out, that's the only way to to actually free right. up your capital, right? Yeah. For real estate beginners in mm -hmm. 2023, what are the strategies that you would recommend them to do? I, I like the wholesale strategy where in the beginning, you talk to people who have houses, you ask them if they want to sell, and you try to find people to wholesale those properties too. I literally talk to people, um, there's certain programs that you can get, actually even for, for multifamily, like Real Track or different programs where you'll have phone numbers of property owners. And I find that I'll call people and ask them if they want to sell their house or sell their building. They'll say, no, they're still growing. So do you want to sell? No, I don't. Are you still growing? Yes, I am. If I come across something for myself that I can't close on, can I showcase it to you? Okay, and what are you looking for? Okay, great. So now I have my database of people who want something. No, oh, they're either selling or a buyer. So if they're not, yeah, if they're yeah. not willing to sell it to or wholesale, then you can turn them into exactly. a buyer. So, I mean, really I'll say, are you looking to sell? They say, no. Anything else? No. No, anybody else? No. Oh, by the way, before I jump off the phone, are you still growing? Oh, yes, you are. Okay, fantastic. No, they're not growing. Okay, uh, well, thank you. But by the way, um, so you're not growing and you're not selling. So do you reach a point where you lose the bug of real estate investing? And they'll say, no, I, don't, I haven't lost the bug. I'm just too tired or I'm too busy. And I'm like, well, if you're too tired and too busy, hey, let me be your Viagra because I am still young. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's the sales pitch. Trademark, <laughs> you know, everything. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm still young. So you know what? I'll be your arms and legs. Yeah. So if you still want to be in the game, because guess what? These guys understand real estate. They bought buildings a long time ago and they've seen them double and triple. So I'm not convincing a doctor here. I'm convincing building owners who've lived it and they got tons of equity. You're solving the problem. They're older. They don't want to be doing the legwork. That's all I'm doing, right? Yeah. Or if they don't want to join venture with me, maybe they got equity in that building. Maybe they want to loan me some money. So it's always going down the line and trying to find. So I would tell younger people to get to talk to people who own properties. Yeah. Change your behavior. If you have a 10 o'clock meeting, 30 minutes away, you leave at nine o'clock. Why? Because if you're driving there and you see somebody outside of a property that looks a little bit run down or some situation, you stop your car, you turn in, you talk to them. And by talking to them, you get to get information that they may want to sell or they may not, somebody else who might want to sell just by leaving 30 minutes early. Right. And that's, that's how it's done because people always want resources. If wholesale is a good avenue to explore right now in today's real estate market, what do you think is the biggest challenge to find? Is it to find a good deal to wholesale or is it to find somebody who can buy it? I think it's to find the deal because there's always somebody who has kept their fields fallow for a number of years. I learned that when you're doing very well, uh, five years I do very well, my sixth and seventh year, I don't buy anything. Because usually markets, they, they kind of go up and down over a seven year period. The last market went up 20 years, but usually every seven years things happen, right? Or sometimes every eight years. Uh, when, the US, when the US presidents change out, it does affect the economy. A lot of people right now have kept their powder dry kept their fields unplanted, kept their fields fallow for the last two years because they were uncertain. So there's a lot of money out there. Those people we can go to to buy things. We just have to now find people who 
who literally uh, want to sell. And that's it. It's by talking to people and asking them, do you want to sell? Have you been thinking of selling? People always think you should go to the, the most rundown house. I used to go to the best house on the street that was overdone because that canvas has been painted as much as that guy can paint. And I say to him, listen, you need a bigger canvas. You can't do any more to this property than you've done. It's such an amazing thing. Are you comfortable with spending the next 10 years watching what you did? Or do you want another property somewhere else that you can start over again? So you're finding the artist. Yeah, yeah, in a sense, right? Yeah. Because people spend a lot of time on their, on their properties. And people want, if you spend that much time on your property, you like doing it. And when it's done, you can't go any further. There's a need that builds up. So I catch them. So not always the bad property, the good property, the best property. And then I talk to them. People say, what resources do I use? Do I read books and different things? Yeah, I, I do those things. But my resource is stopping and talking to people because they give me the resource of that street, of their situation, and uh, what I can do to see if I can help them get from point A to point B. If I can help them get from point A to point B, they can help me too. So whether it's an old house or new house, I would stop and knock on the door and make make the connection. Anything stay sell, you will try to go talk to them because there's always some sort of needs. Always some needs. And I, I don't know if somebody just developed uh, colon cancer or something and they, they need a way out. I can just provide a way out. Actually, it's interesting you mentioned that because like we did, in fact, uh, come across somebody. He was an older gentleman. Life happens. Illness befell him. And uh, you know he, he didn't want to deal with the property anymore. It was a multi-unit property, had multiple tenants in it. A few of them were causing problems. And all of a sudden, he got sick. And he's like, I want to enjoy life. I want yeah. to actually focus on things that really matter to me. Like, I want to spend time with my family. I want to yeah. do this and the other. This property, in order for me to sell it for top dollar, I have to fix it up. I have mm -hmm. to deal with the tenants. It's going to be a mess. We come in because we're younger and we can offer a solution. We can get him out of the picture and he can go do the things he wants quickly. And sometimes it's not that you're going and capitalizing on somebody, you're actually offering them an opportunity of what they want. Because I think you hit it on the nail there. The biggest problem is me saying, why would I do that? Why would I offer that? Why would I sell this? It's not about why, why I would do something. It's we present to the person. And I learned that because my first business when I was 16 was dropping off cookbooks. This is 19, who knows, 81 or 82. Chapters didn't come about until 1996. And I was dropping, 81, I was dropping off cookbooks to businesses and having the receptionist sell them for me. And I would <clears throat> skip all the men-dominated businesses. But I, once I stopped in to get a drink of water at a service station, and the guy says, what do you do? I says, I drop off these cookbooks. He goes, you'll never come by here. I go, well, why would men want a cookbook? He's like, well, I have a sister, I have a mother, I have a grandmother, I need gifts. I want to cook myself. But I learned that you can't choose which customer will want what, or what calamity someone's going through in life. You just have to provide that service to everybody and let them tell you if they need it, right? Don't make any assumption. Don't make those assumptions, you know? So I learned that lesson at 16 years old. I was picking and choosing who will or who will not do something. And I'm looking at it based on through my eyes. And my disbelief or belief system was really affecting my success. Okay, so Matthew, how many books do you read a year as a real estate investor? Well, that's a good question. Um, I read about four books a year. I don't read 20 or 30. And here's what I do. Uh, in January, I might read a book. I might spend all of February trying to take about five or six points from the book. And how do I graph those to my life, to my behavior? And I spend March behaving myself into those four or five things. And I read a book again. And I spend my next three months picking up five more skill sets that I actually behave myself into. By the time I'm finished that year, I've only read four books, but I've picked up 20 behaviors. And I find that if I read a thousand books, and not pick up any behavior, or I read four books and graft about 15 behaviors into my life, it's a lot more success that way. I like that. I actually started doing that this year. Oh, fantastic. So last year and even the year before, I tried to like do at least one book a, uh, sorry, one book a month, right. and I realized that I started losing a lot of information. The information doesn't, doesn't retain, right? right? So, and then I, and I'm, I, started sh I started thinking about, why don't I just read one book, really master, really fully understand it, and then stack the skill set one at a time. That's it. Yeah, so I think I think it's actually pretty effective. In the current book that I'm reading, I know like it's actually the second time I'm reading it. It's a it's who not how. What are the couple of books that you uh you're reading right now? There's a book called uh, Who Took My Cheese or Who Ate My Cheese or something. It's an old book. A lot of people have read this uh, before. And another one called The Mountain Is Me. Uh, my 15 year old daughter wanted to read these books, so I said to her, "I'll get you the books. I'll read them after you read them, so we can talk about stuff, right?" Nice. You know, oh, a way so, to connect with your daughter. A way as to well. connect, yeah.